Uh, Rox, hello everybody. Um, my name is Ian. For a start, I'm not checking my messages. I've got my notes on here. Um, so it's not that I'm not paying attention to anything. Uh, I used to be a games programmer, uh, working on game mechanics and game mechanic design. Um, I have also uh, written and run live events, immersive things, theatre. I spoke about LARP here a couple of years ago. Um, I also wrote in the Bollywood Zombie movie and children's books about Cthulhu. Um, <laughs> these days I co-run this company, Tailspinners. Uh, we uh, help out companies with story, dialogue, plotting, consultancy, voice direction, that kind of thing. Um, and as a result of that, I wanted to talk about this uh, really today, which is telling stories without the words. Um, one of the things we find ourselves doing a lot uh, is we have whole chunks of text uh, and we're trying to make the less text. Partly because it bores people, partly because uh, it's expensive in some cases, particularly when you've got localization and things going on, uh, and partly because there are other ways to do these things. Um, in a way, this is a companion talk to what Chris did this morning. Uh, it also features some camera angle stuff and Lord of the Rings and Daniel Craig, coincidentally. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, the, uh, as a writer, never, as a games writer specifically, never quote by the word, because you spend most of your time trying to take those words out and doing it another way. Uh, this is kind of an entry level talk, I guess. I'm going to rush through a whole load of different things. I hope, uh, I'm sure some of them will be familiar to you, I hope there'll be some bits and pieces in here which will just let you evaluate what you're doing, maybe through a slightly different lens or add another, uh, another thing. I'm not going to talk about games which are purely without words. Uh, I'm going to give some examples of that. Um, but really this is about enhancing what you're doing with words by using other things alongside them to kind of emphasise the point or indeed contradict it. Um, just before we get started, I, I found this as I was doing some research, which is from a Buster Keaton uh, movie, Buster Keaton and Kathy McGuire, I think. Just look at what's happening with the shadow in the background compared to what's happening in the foreground. And it's just a lovely little piece of work. Uh, anyway, some text. Um, so let's kick off with something a bit obvious, which is environment. Now, without the use of any words apart from hot dogs and delicatessen, this shot from Bioshock Infinite just says everything about the environment. I'm not, not going to go hugely into visual design, but uh, the architecture talks about particular triumphalism, the massive statue of the guy who they all think is obviously important, the fact that there is magic going on in the world, or weird tech of some sort, the kind of vintage feel to it is all there without you ever having to explain that. And I hope as people who use visuals as part of their medium, that's a pretty easy thing to grasp and understand. And you can make what's very similar mechanics feel completely different just on the choice of the aesthetics that you use. Uh, this obviously slightly cartoony platformer, this is the people that see from the Sandfox which we're working on, uh, slightly cartoony platformer, but because of the, the feel of the visuals around it, he probably isn't in a place where gravity doesn't apply. Uh, there's probably danger in here, there's probably death, as opposed maybe to something a bit more cartoony, which is essentially the same kind of mechanics, um, but uh, if you sprouted the wings and flew off, you wouldn't be terribly surprised if you hadn't encountered this game before. Um, similarly, this uh, very, very similar presentation, very similar basic mechanics, um, but is uh, obviously giving you a much more dreamlike quality to everything and a much more sinister. Very, very kind of simple stuff. Um, and you can change the feel of a place just by the way you light it, by the way you frame it. Uh, if you imagine that this is the same scene in five different colour palettes. Uh, and if you imagine, say, somebody did a line like, oh, it's good to be home, and they're looking into a beautiful, sunny uh, little town, uh, contrast that with, oh, it's good to be home, over uh, lava death version of your home, and the, the, the word just changed, obviously. Uh, but diving a little bit deeper into um, just kind of look and feel, this is a, a shot from a game called Soma, which I worked on a couple of years ago. Uh, it's deep under the ocean and you're inside a deep underwater base and there is a gigantic steel door, several of them in fact, between sections of the base. Uh, and here we have a gigantic steel door and that's fantastic and it tells us a bunch of things. Um, it tells us that there is a threat here of water uh, crushing into the base and it reminds you of how deep the pressure is around you. Also, it's a horror game. How long is it going to take me to open that door? what might be behind it, and how long would it take me to shut that door again. Just the, the sheer kind of, oh my god, I can see the panic coming already, without having to open it. But there's a couple of other little things here. These are, it might not be quite dark enough, but 
Uh, these are kind of scuffed out yellow warning lines in the bottom here. They show, uh, obviously, used to be a lot of traffic through here. This place isn't brand new. Uh, it's a little bit stained. Uh, but the most obvious thing is we've got that this sign here, which is uh, danger, wet floor, you might slip, just on in pictograms. Um, and that tells us a bunch of stuff. It tells us that there are humans here. Uh, it tells us that humans are fallible still. And it tells us that they probably have a health and safety policy. Um, which, you know, immediately says something about this place and the people, people who live here and, and their level of competence. And this is obviously going into, into environmental storytelling, which I'm sure you've heard for years now. Uh, this, of course, has gone home being the, the, the poster child for that. Um, and for those who aren't aware, um, the primary use of environmental storytelling, the difference really between just the aesthetics and environmental storytelling, is environmental storytelling tends to be laying down objects and patterns and evidence that the player puts together to work out what happened here, what used to happen here. And it can be a really, really powerful way of telling a different story. But what we've found is uh, you can take it to extremes because it's never explained what order events happened in. You can lay out a trail, but if you lay out too much stuff, nobody's going to know what order anything happened in. Um, and that's fine <coughs> if you use this sort of stuff just as a, a cue for how you decorate your spaces. If you're kind of, if you have no idea how you're going to decorate a kitchen, you go, well, maybe somebody able to can and everything here and that, and that. And that's just a cue for the visual designers uh, to be able to fill, it, fill the space satisfyingly. And it becomes background detail. It becomes uh, kind of grain uh, in the background of the world. It's the sort of thing that the Lord of the Rings guys, that uh, wasn't the reference I meant, actually, but the Lord of the Rings guys did on every little buckle, uh, had all of this detail, which you were never going to see in shots, but they did it anyway. It gives this, this kind of authenticity and and just general mood to a piece. So there's kind of two ways you can use this thing. You can use it to go, a murder happened here, and here's the evidence. Or you can use it to just make sure a place feels lived in and give it texture and depth and a kind of feeling. Uh, this place was clearly full of panicking people and stuff thrown everywhere. This place was lived in. This place was a home, something ate pizza here, you know. So you can take those kind of trails of uh, just the kind of visual feel and the mood of a piece, and you can move it outside of the game completely uh, into uh, things like obviously uh, the box, the screenshots, all this kind of thing. And you shouldn't overlook that as a thing to do to get people into the mood and context for what they're going to encounter in your game. Because it completely changes their experience of the game, what they think it's going to be about by the time they get into it. Whether it's going to be a comedy or something, it's this dark serious thing that you can't play. Uh, but just setting up the move, move of the piece. The, the real classic one which we can keep coming back to is uh, Psycho. Uh, in the promo material for the movie Psycho, Alfred Hitchcock released a bunch of information saying that they were going to put paramedics in all of the cinemas showing the film in case somebody had a heart attack. Which immediately builds up expectation and sets the mood before you even start the piece. Um, and if you look at you know just flash screens like this, uh, that says so much about the feel of this game and the type of game it is going to be before you go anywhere near gameplay or introductions or anything. Uh, you can do obviously you can lay out music, all of that kind of stuff on top of this. Uh, Bioshock is another great example of that. Look, you've got the, the Art Deco city in there. You've got the rust, the wear, the tear. You've got water draining down, and you've got the light from below, which is really unusual. And you just say so much about the mood before you go in. Uh, Dragon Age, um, obviously, by the way, I went to town and just slapped blood all over it. <laughs> that's a design choice, but actually it worked for them. And it got, in a time when there was a lot of kind of, uh, comedy fantasy, a lot of sort of fable and things like that out there, they very much went, here is our line in the sand, we're just going to cover everything in blood. And that works. And that, that motif, you can see on the post from there, just get that. Um, so, talking about that sort of motif, let's move on briefly to symbols. So this is. Uh, going to be something which is it, it, hugely deep, so I'm not going to go through all of it. I'm going to go through a couple of practical examples. So obviously, if you have recurring symbols, such as the splat of blood, uh, or recurring objects, key objects, which keep coming back in your story as a repetitive, uh, repetitive motif, then the players will attach some importance, some significance, and they'll understand how it works. Uh, it needn't be objects. It could be a uh, concept, the kind of concept of light and dark, the kind of visual image which keeps coming back, or uh, a, a musical theme which happens a lot in things like Star Wars, that just keeps coming back and, and, and reminding you. There's a couple of practical examples of that. Uh, here is my Lord of the Rings reference. So when they made the movie of Lord of the Rings, they gave Aragorn this brooch, um, and this was given to him by Arwen, his love, um, and then several times later they call back to this, and you can see him looking at that brooch, and that brooch symbolises their relationship symbolises her, and we can see without any words that he is thinking about Arwen, 
Because we're not in his head, we're not in prose in the book, we can't do it any other way. Um, we could have somebody saying a line such as, oh, Arable, are you thinking about Arwen again? And that would just be cheesy and terrible. But this just does all of that without you needing to do that. Um, similarly, for those who have watched Stranger Things, and I will try not to spoil too much, when uh, Eleven is using her powers, she obviously does a kind of frowny brown thing and puts her hands out. But when she's using her powers and it's tough, you get this, this trickle of blood down from her nostril. Um, now, not only does that say she's using her powers, once you've seen that a few times, you see that get that repetitive thing. It also says she's frail, and it says this thing is difficult, and she's putting her all into it, and that's really cool. And then, towards the end of series two, uh, Charlotte is born, but she has to use a lot of power, and she leaves both nostrils, which, you know, is great. Ramp it up. And it's just those little <laughs> visual repetitive things. And I hope she doesn't go any further, because I dread to think where else she's going to leave. Um, sorry. Uh, Right, let's get to Chris's talk this morning. So, uh, framing of a scene. This is from what remains to be this Finch. Um, this, again, is all about environmental storytelling. But what they're very good at as a company um, is guidance through a space. So, um, forgetting this, this image as it is here, if you came to a readers' club, you'd probably go, OK, there's a story to be told here. I'm going to have a look around and start exploring the items, pick up things, look at notes, that kind of thing, get an idea of what's going on. Uh, what they've done here is just by carefully lighting it, they have gone, this is the important spot in the room to pay attention to. This is the centre of everything and where things radiate out. Go look here first. And look, oh, the same chair is over there in the picture. That tells us who lived here. And then, so they very much focus your attention on a particular spot, and then they let you explore from there now. Because this is a 3D space, uh, that's one of the few ways you can do that, because you can't control camera angles. What you can do is you can control the way that somebody comes in through a door. So that if, for example, the doorway goes this way, and the room's over here, and I turn around to look at the room here, what's happened is I've got a reveal of that side of the room to that side of the room, which is effectively a camera panel to hold back a minute. Um, so you can control the way that the person sees a space and the framing of it, but the light is a really good and really simple way to do that. You see that in a lot of 2D adventure games. Um, talking of which, cameras. So I'm not going to go into huge detail about this. Uh, obviously we're thieving stuff from cinema, as, as Chris said earlier. Uh, that's partly because those that cinematic language, that grammar is so inculcated in our heads because of all the stuff we've consumed over the years that we can use that to play tricks with it. Um, I do want to talk about uh, briefly about the pan uh, and the zoom uh, just as storytelling techniques. What they actually are, uh, the pan, I hope people know what is kind of moving across a frame like that. Uh, and a tilt is looking like that. Uh, we'll come to the zoom in a second. And what those are is those are storytelling moments. They are reveals. When you start the scene, you see a little bit of it, you learn a little bit of stuff, learn a little bit more, learn a little bit more, oh, and there's a thing. And you can use that either to back up the information you've already seen, or you can use that to surprise them at the end. Uh, here's a, it's a fairly simple one from Shutter Island. So we have a lonely, lost seashore somewhere, maybe an island, maybe something, and here we have a lighthouse. Oh, dangerous storms, wreckage, there is danger sleeping here in this place. And it just gives a little bit more than the first start of the pattern. It's a slow reveal. Had you done, had you done that in one shot, that realisation kind of moment isn't there. Um, I don't know, if I press this button, what happens? Stay back for it. Um, so a, a zoom, work, or a dolly, depending on how you're doing it, works in a very similar way. Uh, a zoom out when you're focusing tight on somebody's head and you pull out like that, or an object, it's another, it's another reveal. It says, here's a thing, and now here's the stuff around it. Yeah, and gradually reveals that stuff. A zoom in is, is far more interesting. It's used generally in two kinds of ways. Firstly, it can be used to uh, get inside somebody's head. They're not thinking about a thing. They're not thinking about anything in the space or around them. They're thinking about something somewhere else. You focus in closer on the head, and you're cutting information out of the side of the frame. Uh, and you end up there in front of them, and they're clearly not thinking about that. They're thinking about whatever they've been talking about for the past few minutes, or whatever object they just looked at. Um, similarly, if you, uh, you can also use it to show somebody's concentrating. If you're looking from somebody's point of view, um, and you say, cut to an object, so you've seen their face, you cut to an object, and you zoom in on that object or that person, they're ignoring everything else, and they're thinking really hard about that thing that they're looking at. And you can use that for all sorts of tricks. A uh, simple zoom example here. Here is Mr. Daniel Gray. He's thinking very hard about a thing. We know what it is because we saw it in the previous scene. Uh, he's thinking really hard about it, considering it. In fact, really, really hard about it. <laughs> really hard about it. 
And then the director's being a bit of a bastard to us. And this is a reveal. Here he is. He's wearing a balaclava. He's somewhere out in the woods. And as the last punch of the reveal, he's holding a gun. So a nice little zoom is at the reveal. Uh, obviously, you could do all those still shots, but they're nothing like as powerful. Uh, what am I talking about now? Oh yeah, camera angles. Um, so, uh, pretty much as Chris was saying, if you go high on something, they feel small and weak. If you go low on something, you're probably uh, the less dominant figure in this particular scene. Um, Chris br briefly mentioned this as well. I just want to come back to it um, because <coughs> this is taught pretty badly at film school. This is the kind of thing which might uh, might fit with what you're doing with visual novels or the kind of dialogue scenes you get in uh, Mass Effect, that kind of stuff. Uh, the framing of these characters uh, isn't sort of to do with aesthetic choice, really, in terms of, uh, oh, uh, I want to see her whole coat, and I, I want to see her from the waist up, which, weirdly, some films would seem to teach it as. It's actually that personal space. The, the person we see in the shot here, up to about the medium long shot, is probably a stranger to us, to our viewpoint character. The mid shot here, we know who she is. We know her. Um, here, she's a friend. Here she's a close friend, or protagonist, or, or antagonist, because she's getting into our personal space. Here she's probably a lover, or a nemesis, or whichever way you, you, you want to frame it. Here we're probably inside her head, thinking from that point of view. Um, and and uh, I've a long rant about how that developed at some point, but uh, if I'm in a bar. Um, but it, it's, it's worth thinking about that. If you're cutting between two characters, for example, and one is your protagonist, they should almost certainly be closer in, and you should think about their relationship to the other person. Is it a stranger? Is it somebody uh, close up? Uh, another cinematic thing which is buried in our heads, um, which is kind of weird. Um, for platform games, mostly you go from the left of the screen to the right of the screen. Most of them. Um, and the reason for that is that in the Western world particularly, we are used to the idea of progress being from the left to the right. Uh, it's partly because it's how we read, uh, but your idea of a timeline of history or, or Lottie's slide about how a, 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 an item floats through the production phase goes from left to right. That's what we're used to. So people make progress from left to right. Happens in cinema all the time, whether you notice it or not. Most of the time in Western media, um, when the characters are making progress, when they're uh, the good guys, if you like, they're going left to right um, in, in, in most of the movies. Um, if they're not making progress or if they're struggling really hard, they might go right to left. In particular, if you're trying to sort out two factions, one of whom is storming a castle and one of whom is defending a castle, you will always show one of the factions going in one direction and one of the factions going the other, and you shouldn't flip that around or you'll just confuse the hell out of your audience. Um, but you can make use of that to tell stories. Uh, if you have a character going from the top left of a frame to the bottom right of a frame, that feels really easy to us. That feels natural. If the gravity is kind of pulling that out. Even if it's not going down a hill, even if it's just been crossing a, a, a street top down, that feels naturally to your audience like an easy motion. And the opposite, this one, if they're progressing to a really difficult thing that they're struggling to, they go bottom right, top left. You don't need to change anything about their speed, you don't need to change anything else about the whole thing, it will feel harder to people. Really? 10 minutes already? Uh, I'll blast through this. Character performance, uh, lots of animation. That's all you need to know. Uh, you can do so much. <laughs> you can do so much with animation, I don't want to go deeply into it. Obviously, you can say things about the story and character design. What's interesting about it from a storytelling point of view is you completely undercut a line by having the body language of the character do something different to the line that they have delivered, uh, which gives you subtext and is worth, uh, worth thinking about. Uh, I want to call out um, uh, Little Nightmares because they have fantastic animation uh, in there. <laughs> Uh, where you can easily tell if the character is hurt, tired, or scared, but you are still, crucially, controlling the character. Um, and your, your controls are still affecting them, but they feel uh, broken and hurt, and whatever else they do with the game, play the game, which leads me to mechanics. Uh, we can show emotions by not using any words through uh, fable-like interactions and the, the kind of emotes you get in, the, in MMOs. Uh, we can get a bit more subtle, uh, things like Journey, which again Chris mentioned, a fantastic uh, example of almost all the things I've been talking about. But the interaction between two characters there who can only interact via running around and, and whistling with each other, it's amazing the depth of meaning you can get into that. Um, and that is player generating, which is also fantastic. Um, Divinity, Original Sin 2, does a really interesting thing. Where you've got your standard dialogue trees, uh, occasionally, rather than a line of dialogue as a choice, you have the chance to uh, use a gesture, you have a chance to hug somebody, tap them on the shoulder, that kind of thing. 
which builds up a level of empathy, again without using dialogue words, uh, which you don't really see in too many in too many other games other than this, of course, Ico, uh, where uh, for those who don't know, you're leading a princess through a castle. Uh, they could have implemented it so you press a button and you kind of call her and she walks up to you and follows you, but no, they implemented it by you taking her hand and leading her around place. As a result, you're building an empathetic link. And at the end of the game, you have forged a relationship with this character just because of a simple choice of how you, how you use that mechanic. This, I'm not going to spoil, but it's called Brothers Two Sons. If you haven't played it, buy it. It's not that long, play it from beginning to end, and it will show you something about game mechanics and storytelling which you will never see uh, in anything else. Couldn't be done in any other medium. It's fantastic. Spec Ops The Line has an amazing uh, uh, non, uh, set of non verbal choices. Uh, for example, you have a crowd of uh, uh, civilians over the body of one of your fallen comrades, uh, you have two verbs, move around and shoot, uh, and you can clear that crowd, and the natural reaction is to, of course, shoot them. You can shoot in the air and scatter the crowd, uh, but nobody lays that choice out for you, it's just a question of how you use the mechanics and the verbs which are available to you, which is an amazingly powerful moment. I'm going to skip over on music because it'll take too long. Uh, I'm not going to talk very much about audio and music, which is really sad because it is fantastic, but I hope from cinema, from almost everything you've seen, you can see how audio can create a creature in people's heads even when it's not there on screen. You can create um, ambience to a space and storytelling to a space through what you're laying down in terms of environmental tracks. Uh, you can create sound cues to catch people's attention. And of course music is hugely underused still in most games, even if we were to, to use the kind of cheesy sound piano uh, that you get in soap operas, that would be better than the, a bunch of games that are out there. And it can massively enhance mood. And if people are in the right uh, uh, frame of mind, they won't even notice the music. It just goes straight to their brain and change, change their emotions. Uh, briefly, uh, other senses. Uh, touch, I've talked about briefly in, in, in Divinity as a, as, a, as a thing we can do. Um, but obviously there's, there's rumble feedback again. Uh, I don't overlook. Uh, the subtlety you can get out of the rumble feedback from the control. If you do it right, it will massively enhance the experience without the player noticing that it's happening. They'll just tune it out. They'll realise, for example, if they pass into a magical zone, and every time you do that, you give them just a little rumble on the controller, they will recognise that as a recurring motif, and they'll know exactly what's going on. They don't need to pop up people and say, we're in a magic zone, or anything like that. They can just get that feel for it. Um, Bizarrely, smell and taste are also things we can do. The best example I've had of this recently is Dishonored 2, where you have a whole lot of rotting corpses surrounded with flies. You have the sound, you have the juiciness of the textures, uh, and you have the kind of glistening nature of everything, and you can smell those corpses. And you can also flag it by using words, which is the reverse of what I said at the beginning of the talk, but you can have a character call out how badly something smells. And if you get those cues right, you'll start to make the player feel that queasy as well. Um, similarly with taste, you can have, you know, glistening fruit or whatever it happens to be, you can trigger those centres. Um, and then, nearly finished, uh, omission. Uh, sometimes the, the most powerful thing you can do is, is just rip the thing out entirely and not show it. Take the monsters out, go back to Alien or Jaws, take the monsters out. Um, critically, one good thing to think about is if the player is already thinking a line of dialogue, like, what an amazing place this is, don't have them say it. Just pull the line. If you're happy that the player is in the right mood and knows what's happening at that point, just pull the line from them. Don't have to state the obvious because you should be relying on what the player's thinking rather than the uh, dialogue coming out of a character three seconds too late for the realisation. Um, sometimes the unsaid <coughs> words are just... <sighs> <laughs> their imagination wherever you can, just pull, pull things out and trust your players. Don't pander to them. I've lost count of the number of times we've, we've created an alpha uh, cut of the game, uh, we've gone through the game and we've just gone, we don't need that line, it's already there, it's all in the environment, um, and just trust your players just to get the thing, just pull stuff out and see if it still works, and most of the time it will, and they'll get it. A um, couple of examples you should probably try. Uh, this game is called Virginia, uh, came out last year. Um, it is uh, entirely without words, apart from some stuff written on some files. I don't agree with all the storytelling choices, but it's a really good example of how to do things through simple props, simple actions, uh, and the music is fantastic. Uh, play that. Uh, play in line, as I talked about briefly before, it's like, uh, I don't know, Terry Gilliam and Jean-Paul Gionne and Neil Gaiman ganged up in an alley and beat Sackboy around the head. Um, 
uh, it's a fantastic piece of work. There are no words in everything. It's deeply scary, but you get all of the emotions through everything that the characters are doing. Um, and finally, play Inside, uh, which for those who are old enough to remember Another World, is basically that with a difficulty turned down to about three. Um, and it tells a fantastic story without any word, or well, anything verbal in the game at all, through uh, interactivity. It doesn't pause for cutscenes or anything like that. Everything is told in the background as you play the game through, and it's got, uh, I don't want to spoil it, just play it. Um, and that's it. by figuring out different depths of fields and kind of trying to focus in on individual details. That really mean, oh, that's, that happens. Um, uh, there are obviously moments in games where you're looking for a viewfinder on something, where you're using a telescope or, or that kind of thing. Uh, where it's most widely used, I guess, is just by visual designers on forcing you to see specific things. So for example, if they want you to see a specific feature in a room, they might make it so the only way you can see that is through a, a narrow slot or something like that, and you won't get the full reveal until you go around and see it from another angle. That gets used a lot of part of games. Uh, but no, otherwise. Uh, Ian, I'm afraid I'm going to have to call time. I told you that. Yeah. Sorry, guys. Cheers.